Welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. We're going to be doing part two of our discussion of uh, Lobachevsky's Ponderology, Chapter 5 on Pythocracy, picking up where we left off last week. Um, we talked about the first two phases of the uh, you know, institution of a pythocracy. We're going to get into the third phase and kind of a pseudo fourth phase and uh, related stuff. I just wanted to read one thing from the section last week that we didn't get to. Um, because the first two phases, just as a really quick summary, are kind of like the the adoption of a what Lobachevsky calls schizoidal ideology, basically just a simplistic ideology that identifies all the problems of the world and then proposes a solution to them. So in that regard, Lobachevsky writes, uh, during stable times, which are ostensibly happy, albeit dependent upon injustice to other ind individuals and nations, doctrinaire people believe they have found a simple solution to fix the world. Such a historical period is always characterized by an impoverished psychological worldview, so that a schizoidally impoverished psychological worldview does not stand out, does not stand out as odd during such times and is accepted as legal tender. These doctrinaire individuals characteristically manifest a certain contempt with regard to moralists, then preaching the need to rediscover lost human values and to develop a richer, more appropriate psychological worldview. That just stuck out to me because um, these phenomena, all of these kind of uh, processes and things going on that lead to a pathocracy are arguably going on all the time in all countries, in all nations. You know, wherever, wherever there are people, there are going to be people coming up with bad ideologies. And so you'll be able to find it all over the place. And so that just reminded me of um, that last sentence about the contempt with which um, certain people regard people preaching the need to rediscover lost human values mm -hmm. and more appropriate psychological worldviews. Well, that just reminded me of Jordan Peterson. That's primarily what he does. He's preaching, you know, he's... He's preaching the need to dis to rediscover lost values and adopting a more psychological, uh, more appropriate psychological worldview. And just look at the number of people um, in society, uh, which arguably are, arguably aren't very many, and it's of a particular like type of person. You know, primarily in the media and you know places in academia and and in like you know social justice movements, it's this small like group of people who just have total contempt for him. Um, seem to totally misunderstand what he's doing um, and then to completely misrepresent what he's doing. But it might be that a lot of the, um, a lot of the reaction to Jordan Peterson and just the, the kind of really um, common sense things that he has to say for the most part, that the, the motivation for that is perhaps coming from a, a different sort of motivation, not the, not the motivations that, uh, that seem to to be um, being used on the surface. It's like they, they don't have any kind of like principled moral rejection of like common sense values. It's that there is something about common sense, traditional like universal values that irks a lot of peop these people. And that might be because there is something actually wrong with the c kind of people making these critiques. Is it the, that there is something offensive about common universal like morality and 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 values to to certain people and this is what we talked about last week about the types of individual that individuals that infiltrate um social movements in this case social justice movements and that um the the reason for their um for their joining these movements and seeking kind of political power is because they have a fundamentally different uh different worldview they see individuals they see humanity they see human nature in uh, a very different manner and they see ordinary like normal people with common sense and their their morality they see that as oppressive and the the vast majority of people disagree the vast majority of people are fine you know with their with their ordinary you know universal universe almost universally held moral values um, but to a small segment of the segment of the population that is totally oppressive and in its, in its extreme form, just think of extreme criminals like serial killers. For a serial killer, um, the like the 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 structure the the structure of society is an oppressive force, because you know the cops are after them. Ordinary people revile them, are disgusted by them, but they want to do what they want to do, and they've got a particularly pathological you know aim and purpose in life, 
which is something that the vast majority of people see as morally reprehensible and, uh, and repulsive. But now, now just put yourself in the position of that poor serial killer, right? It's like they, they, they would feel oppressed in that situation because everyone hates them. They can't reveal who they are. They can't reveal their true motivations, their true nature, because they would literally be lynched in the streets, and they have been. So these are the kind of people that join social movements, unfortunately, because the social movements are often started with, uh, you know, at least good motivations. There's a problem, and we want to fix it. That's, what, that's how it appears on the surface. But that's, never the, very rarely the way, that's very rarely the way things go, because of these sorts of phenomena that, we're, that we'll be talking about. So uh, we discussed the, you know, phase one, which is kind of the adoption of a, an ideology of this sort and the kind of individuals that get involved and the kind of, um, 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 you know, the motivations for joining a group like this. But the, but the fact is that, the, that it will inevitably fail in, in, in comparison or, you know, or relative to its original aims because of the, the problems inherent in the ideology. So in phase two, you start getting more pathological people joining the, joining the movement and uh, brutalizing the concepts and using it for um, kind of starting to use it for more ulterior purposes, ulterior, uh, ulterior motives. And then in phase three, this is, this is where things kind of, this is where things start to get really ugly. So um, this is kind of a, this is probably, I guess this could happen maybe even like before a revolution, during a revolution, or after a revolution. I'm, I, I, don't have, I don't have knowledge of enough actual revolutions to, to see if there's a pattern here. But um, this is essentially what you could call the psychopathic takeover of a movement. Uh, a movement which, which was previously dominated by mostly ordinary people um, adopting a, a slightly pathological ideology and um, and then joined by people with more kind of personality problems and behavior issues, and at this point, it's this is where the the, the psychopaths kind of um, or psychopathic individuals kind of perceive uh, uh, it's like seeing a weakened animal, um, easy prey. It's like okay, well, I, I can see the direction that this social movement is going, and I'm going to capitalize on that. So this is where we see the first, um, the first kind of purging processes going on, where the, the real true believers, who are mostly, um, mostly normal people, m normal misguided people, <clears throat> um, they start to become the targets within their own organization. And, uh, and this is because, because of, that's basically what, these, what the psychopaths joining the movement want, is um, they've got their own like utopian dream of of taking over, of gaining political power, and forcing more f forcing the majority of people, normal people, into a form of servitude. And the way they do that is by adopting the ideology for themselves, pretending to profess it, when in actuality they don't actually care about anything in the ideology. These people. Couldn't you know? Couldn't care less about like communism, for instance, or or Marxism, or or like alt right, you know, uh, um, like ethno nationalism, or even nationalism, like people joining like a radical nationalist movement. It's like these people don't actually care about any of that. Um, that is all uh, just a mask that the, that the psychopathic individuals will wear. So at the but at the same time, you have people that really believe in those ideologies. So you do have like real, um, real ethno-nationalists, you do have real communists, you do have real um, like Salafi jihadists, um, you know, in, in any kind of, any movement of this, any ideological movement, you have true believers, but those, even those true believers as, as bad and as pathological as they may appear, are not the worst. Um, there, there's something even worse than that. And so this is where, this is where it kind of starts to acquire its truly kind of pathocratic nature is as the influence of psychopaths um, comes to prominence. And Lobachevsky, one of the things that he points out is that the, the first role individuals like this will play is, I think you mentioned it last week, Corey, it's like you need someone to do the dirty work. So often the psycho, psycho, a psychopath will join a movement of this sort and he's more than willing to, to do the dirty work that the other people find um, distasteful to some degree. This might be, you know, engaging in acts of like sabotage or vandalism or political assassination or torture. Um, 
they're fine with that. You know, they'll be like, oh, well, guys, just let me do that because uh, I know, you know, I know that uh, it, it's a bit hard on you, but that's a, you know, that's a job that I can do for you. And so the, like the ordinary members will, will kind of be thankful on the one hand, but repulsed on the other. Like they, they still have, you know, some semblance of a conscience. So it's like, well, so they'll, they'll rationalize, rationalize it. It's like, well, someone needs to do it. So, uh, so we'll, we'll let these guys, you know, do their work, not, not knowing that the, that this is the reason that these guys are doing this work is not only because they like it, because they're using it as a, as a, to get their foot in the door in this movement so that they can rise uh, through the hierarchy of this um, like political movement. And so there's, there's a, a, a variety of reactions to individuals of, like this in the group. You've got the, the kind of like reluctant acceptance and thankfulness for someone getting the job done. And you've got the, um, then you've got the people who actually admire them. So the more pathological people in the social movement will actually be like, oh, wow, it's like, I really like this guy. You know, he knows what he's, no, he knows what he's doing. He's, he's a kind of guy I can get behind. So, so they start basically getting fans within the movement um, and can establish their own social network within, within such an organization that then um, further grows and gains, gains more power within the movement. And the normal people in, in the organization often have no idea what's going on. They don't understand like psychopathology. They just, they, they might realize that there's something a bit off about this guy. You know, he's, well, just by virtue of the fact that he can do, he is willing to do things that they personally wouldn't do, but without any kind of real psychological insight into why that is the case, um, they don't understand what's happening. They don't understand why the, the, like the movement seems to be going in slightly different directions, why it seems to be taking a slightly more radical turn. It's like they can't, they, they often don't make the connection basically between the, the two phenomena. And so what actually, what, what, how that, how that plays out in like the actual, um, like more, more broad or broader, um, government structure in epithocracy, like when a, a group of like this is in power, is that um, the the psychopaths in charge, they 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 do essentially form their own kind of like a, you could call it a deep state or a, a conspiracy between between them, and that they have um, goals and motivations and aims that are you know at odds with even the ideology that they publicly profess. But the way they actually see re see the world and see their their own country and their own nation is that the people, all of the people beneath them, are just, uh, um, they're, well, they are like slaves. The, 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 they aren't valued at all as like you know as patriotic citizens or anything like that. In fact, patriotic citizens are people to be especially watched out for because they might have other ideas about how the country should be run, you know, they, and they might criticize you. So you get this. Um, you what you get both in the um, development of the pathocracy and in like the the pathocracy as it's kind of instantiated in in government form is a type of like uh, of infighting. There is an internal conflict both within the movement and in between the the government and the people. So in the movement itself, you get um, like the purges of of the true believers because the true believers will say well no this isn't what we actually signed up signed up for these are what our goals are you know read our manifesto um you know <laughs> article 7 article 3 article 12 it's like you're not you're not following these it's like well okay you've kind of outlived your usefulness to the movement at this point because you're focusing on these trivialities um so they might get the boot they might be uh, they might be killed uh, depending on the you know the circumstances and so it's at this point that the original ideology becomes a complete caricature. It's used for completely different purposes. And this is why like old communists in, in the, you know, in the USSR and related countries would um, um, become critics of the, the communist government because they're, they're working completely at odds with what mm -hmm. they should have been working at according to, you know, the, the original ideology, the original communist values. And, so that is essentially how Lobachevsky describes stage three. Uh, one other thing I mentioned last week is that the psychopaths are very, very adept at attaching themselves to liberation ideologies. Um, you know, whether communist or, you know, LGBT or, um, um, you know, ethno-nationalist, whatever the movement might be. If there's a wrong that needs writing, if there's a, 
uh, a people that needs saving, um, those groups, th those movements will tend to be infiltrated by psychopaths because they can see how they can be used. They can be, they, they see how they can be used to rise to power, essentially, because by writing a great wrong, um, the, the movement itself has popular appeal and potential to not only gain more popular appeal, but potential to, to write that wrong ostensibly and, um, be a hero essentially. So what's, what, what's a, a better, um, you know, mask to wear? What's a, a better movement to, to infiltrate and, and gain power through than one like that, which will have great popular support and which will, um, um, you know, provide the accolades of being a, a social justice warrior, being a liberator of your of your people or of of your class or whatever. It's like uh, you got to watch out for that because things are not all, always what they seem. Um, so that's pretty much um, stage three, kind of just the development of how it's how, you know the, the various stages of how a group is pathologized and like infiltrated by individuals not even like i'd say probably only the psychopaths like actively infiltrate in a, uh, a movement like they you know they're basically scheming in their minds they're very Mach machiavellian it's like okay well i'm going to join this movement for this purpose because they can use it like all the other stages are are by people who believe in what they're doing for one reason or another it's like you've got the 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 useful idiots and the the just the like the people with good intentions and and um you know trying to trying to fix the world, trying to fix a problem. And then you've got the people who also want to fix the problem, but for slightly different motivations. It's like, you know, they, they might feel uh, oppressed to some degree or another, and they, they just want to stick it to the, to the, per, the, the person that's oppressing them. Um, slightly, more, slightly more pathological, slightly like less self-control and, you know, common sense and, you know, overall healthy worldview. And then once that has played itself out enough, it's like th then it's ripe for uh, like for takeover, and that's where you get an actual um, like uh, manipulative, like Machiavellian takeover, basically. And that's essentially what a pathocracy becomes: is a um, a group operating in a government, you know, operating under the the use of a like kind of complete ideology that has gained gained its gained gained its success through the support of the people for that ideology that then at, at that point the the ideology has just become a mask um, strictly for um, like public consumption and even then that corrodes and so we'll see that in the you know in the in the way pathocracy plays out um, before getting into that I'll just give a couple definitions that uh, or maybe just one definition of path pathocracy that Lobachevsky gives. He describes it as absolute domination um, of government by pathocrats. So I think that's an important distinction. I've mentioned it on previous shows that we've where we've talked about ponderology. It's the absolute domination that is the important part about pathocracy because uh, just by itself, pathocrat in Lobach the way Lobachevsky used the term can be anyone in any government who is pathological to any degree. And you're going to get people like that everywhere in every government. Um, so you'll have pathocrats everywhere. You know, every government has pathocrats. Not every government, not every society is a pathocracy. The pathocracy is the absolute domination of like a of a of a like a, a ramified like like linked group of of individuals that have complete domination of a country. And by that, you know. He means complete. He means from the very top positions, all the influential positions around those positions, and then at every node, every top node of the hierarchy from top to bottom. So it is completely, it's like a, a crystalline structure. It's not like, oh, here's some bad people here doing that. Oh, here's some bad people here doing that. But here's some, you know, good people who are relatively, you know, free and, and you know, doing things according to the way they've always done them. And here's, you know, another people, another group of people who's you know, doing things. It's not like modeled like that. It's not, um, you know, you know it, it, it is stark in its like, in its hierarchy. It's like a, you know, a, a total like New World Order pyramid type thing going on. It's like evil person, evil person at every, every node to the point where when you like, when you go 
into town, like, well, if you live in a village, everyone above, like, everyone above you in a position of authority is working strictly for the party, whether it's the, you know, the party in power, whether it is your police chief or you, the, the boss at a factory um, and the managers at the factory or the, um, you know, the, the people at the post office. It's like everywhere you go, there will be like repre representatives of that system. So there's basically nowhere to go, nothing you can do. There's no way you can escape it. It is that, um, it is that entrenched and that like pervasive, pervasive and like specifically defined and outlined. Yeah, and an important point is, is at at that point you are criminalized for having human inclinations, for being a normal person within this pathocratic system. You you uh, you can't think a critical thought. You can't speak a critical thought without being risk being of uh, reported, being you know thrown in prison, and even you know an extremely corrupt system. Uh, you know, if you imagine a very corrupt like imperial government, like the like the this. Uh, Russian Empire. You know, if you were a, a critic of the Russian Empire, if you were caught with subversive materials, you uh, you could you would get um, you know sent to Siberia or exiled or something. But when if you were a critic of Stalin, you were sent to a gulag and you were worked to death. Whereas you know in a, in a normal even a corrupt system of government, um, you will you can pay the price for having the wrong kinds of opinions or doing the wrong kinds of things. But in a pathocracy. Just being a person is wrong. Being having your normal human intellect is something that is derided and constantly brutalized, as we pointed out in previous shows, by spellbinders, by people who condescend every normal human sentiment that you that you might have. And I just wanted to touch on something that you said, Harrison. You were talking about the ideology and the purposes it, it serves. And I think that one of the big purposes that this ideology serves is that it feigns competence on the part of these corrupt or pathological individuals, is that they can say, they can pretend to know what they're doing because the ideology says so. The ideology says, this is what I'm supposed to do, so I obviously know what I'm doing because I know the slogan. And so once you know the slogan, then you are de facto competent at what you're doing. Whereas, in fact, with, you know, the pathocratic governments that we watch, you know, we, that you can read of how they emerged in the 20th century, they, you'd get into, into a position of power, and I'm thinking specifically of Stalin, when he was first tasked with putting down, you know, peasant uprisings when they were, you know, outlawing grain and everything. He, he had no idea what he was doing. He went in there, he had to, he had to rely on the military in order to, to suppress these revolts, but he hated the military. And so instead of going and fighting the actual subversives, the people who were doing the fighting, he just, he, that's, he began his police state uh, maneuvering where he would just come up with crimes on, on the part of anybody. He would just make crimes up because he had no idea what he was doing. So instead of fighting the subversives, he just started you know, wholesale imprisoning and killing and torturing innocent people because for a pathological individual who is completely incompetent, you, they, you can't face up to your own incompetence and ask for help from more competent individuals. Mm -hmm. In this you know, the increasingly pathocratic regime, you just crack down. You, you cannot own up to being imperfect in any way so any sense that you might be imperfect from a subordinate or especially you know somewhat just some ordinary stupid slave in the population and you can expect to receive that pathocrat's wrath to the utmost that's a very important i think component too well uh harrison you mentioned a few moments ago how the uh the, the deep state in the u.s as it exists uh this uh, infrastructure of intelligence agencies and uh and non-governmental organizations and and um, and uh, military industrial complex uh, companies um, that we've come to understand as the deep state, which has its own set of agendas and and um, and policies that they want to push forward, uh, can be said to to be something like a a a budding or um, or a kind of latent. Uh, pathocracy that um, that might be working uh, to become uh, full blown, uh, you might say. Uh, very recently, only a few days ago, 
just to give some kind of window into the uh, the psychological um, uh, substrate, as uh, Lobachevsky would say, of um, of Secretary Mike Pompeo. Uh, he was recently giving a discussion at Texas A and M University uh, as part of a lecture series. So here he is in public uh, talking about um, his uh, experience, I think, at West Point and also with the CIA. And um, it's kind of like that, uh, it's kind of like the arrogant statements, you know, we remember Carl Rove or, or some other of the uh, George Bush administration saying as the war on terror came into full blown um, reality, which is, you know, we will change reality, we're the reality makers, and while you're studying it, we'll change it again. Um, so there, there is, a, I think, a real window into the type of thinking that uh, goes into the creation of a pathocracy. Um, it's ironic because Pompeo is serving at the at the pleasure of Donald Trump, who uh, we're constantly being told not to like. We're not supposed to like this guy, but but Pompeo managed to find this position of power, uh, even though he's arguably part of the deep state, and this. This little clip that we're about to play shows the, the psychological reality of that. So uh, maybe we can play that back and, and, uh, and see what we can see. All right, I think we have time for one last question. Hi, Mr. Secretary. My name is Ben Allen, and I'm a civil engineering student. My question for you is, how do you balance condemnations with concessions and diplomacy with a controversial government such as Saudi Arabia? Thank you. So I always begin with um, a deep understanding that no Secretary of State gets through their first day without recognizing was it's a tough world out there. <laughs> um, we don't appreciate how glorious it is uh, to be here in the United States of America on a consistent enough basis and with enough fervor. Maybe you do here at Texas A&M, but I think too many Americans don't understand how blessed we are. These are there are many, many tough places out there. Having said that, not all tough places are the same. They each present a different set of challenges. I, I, uh, it reminds me, you would know this, but as a, this is a bit of an aside, um, but in terms of how you think about problem sets, I, when I was a cadet, what's the first, what's the cadet motto at West Point? You will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. Mm. I, I, I was the CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, <laughs> stole. It's, it was like, we, we, had, we, had entire, we had entire training courses. Uh, mm. I, I, I was the CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we steal, stole. It's, it was like, we, we, had, we, had entire, we had entire training courses. Uh, it, uh, so uh, he's not critical of lying, cheating, or stealing, or being part of a system that would have training courses. Uh, in such things. It's a very, it's a very kind of shocking admission in a way because you're not supposed to think of, you know, one of your number one uh, intelligence agencies uh, in, in any country as something that is uh, as pathological as, uh, as he would present it to be in that short description. Uh, but there it is. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any other thoughts as to how that... Uh, uh, I don't really agree. Uh, well, you know, I agree with the <clears throat> the main thrust of the argument, but that is what all intelligence agencies do. Like, um, you know, that's what the CIA has always done. That's what the KGB does. That's what every intelligence agency de does. Is they they have to lie. Um, the the role of a spy is to lie about who you are. Um, cheat and steal. It's like that is the those are the trade craft. That's the trade craft of spying and of of being in an intelligence agency. You're trained to steal secrets, to steal information, to sometimes steal people and to steal, you know, like, I'm not saying it's, it's good. I'm just saying it's, it's not really shocking. Um, and, and so on the one hand, I'm like, it's, it's nice to have him admit it. And I think one of the reasons he admitted, admitted it might even be because he was slightly shocked at it. 
You know, because like he said, he grew up at West Point where you lying, lighters, cheaters, and stealers, or thieves were, you know, seen as bad people. Mm -hmm. You get to the CIA, you realize, oh, well, that's what they do all the time. It's like, uh, I, I'm not sure how much of his laughter was, oh, that was such a great time. You know, I love doing it. And how much of it was, wow, you know, we really do a lot of that. And, and at the same time, he can get behind it because it's America, you know, and you, they're doing it for their country. I mean, that's what... that. If you look at the pr presentation of the CIA in films, for instance, over the years, you've seen you've seen like a a progression of how the CIA is portrayed, and especially in the last couple decades, the portrayal of the CIA, um, and this has been for PR reasons, you know, for for putting certain ideas in the minds of the populace, is like we talked about um, earlier in like stage three of uh, phase three of the creation of a pathocracy. There's dirty work, and someone's got to do it. That's the message that has been put across in, you know, representations of the CIA in film. It's that there, there's tough work that needs to be done. We need tough men to do it, tough men and women. You know, people who, who are willing to put their morality to the side in order to, you know, fight for their country. And so on the one hand, it's not at all shocking because that's, that's what intelligence agencies have been doing, um, arguably as long as there have been intelligence agencies, but particularly in, like since World War II and during World War II. Um, but the, like, to place the, all of that in like the, the wider context of um, like the you know what we're discussing today, there's um, I think this this is the this is one of the reasons why um, why ponderogenesis or the development of a pathocracy happens and why it takes us off guard when it does, because if you look at the CIA for instance, you can see how how all of that developed. Out, you know, out of necessity from the people involved. It's like, well, we need to do this, um, so let's do it. You know, because if we don't, the Russians will, for instance. And so you get lying, cheating, and stealing going on. And at first, perhaps, you know, you have relatively, you know, stable, well-off, you know, educated, relatively decent people involved in spy work, like during World War II. Then you have the dirty work that needs to get done, so just like in phase three, you get people who are willing to do the dirty work and other people in the CIA are like, CIA are like oh, well, you know, those are kind of the crazy guys. You know, they do stuff that we wouldn't do. And eventually you get more, of, more and more of that happening to the point where nowadays, right, you've got Gina Haspel, torture queen, running the CIA. And it's arguably been like that for decades where you, you do have totally reprehensible individuals with no shred of morality who, who are able to... Um, to achieve, you know, high positions in the CIA because they are able to to put up the the mask of um, of you know fighting the good fight. It's like, well, it's it's dirty work, but someone's got to do it. In that, in a situation like that, anyone can get away with anything because there's dirty work and someone's got to do it. Like you you can't argue with that um, because someone's got to do it, right? Well, like, so. Uh someone's got to do it and and then the question becomes uh someone's got to do what does it have to be taken to the level uh that the CIA in particular has taken it and that and that really i think is is the distinction in my mind when i hear a quote like that yes um as a as a matter of definition you're going to have spy agencies who need to play dirty in order to get information to protect their governments uh, for example, and then you have, like you said, you have a Gina Haspel, um, who I think was just confirmed as the head of uh, the CIA, um, who is uh, arguably uh, very evil uh, for for committing acts of torture and, and rendition and organizing it in such a way for years, uh, and and putting a nice face on it in the name of protection of the U.S. and fighting the war on terror. Mm -hmm which is completely bogus. So maybe a little reading into Pompeo's comment uh, further than necessary, because on the surface of it, he's not saying uh, cheating, lying, and, and doing all that, as well as you know, torture, dirty tricks, false flags, mm -hmm. uh, you know, arming insurgents. I mean, he, he doesn't mention all that in one fell swoop. Uh, but certainly, um, to me, uh, it, it, it certainly strikes me as a kind of um, 
uh, especially when you when you know when you know what the CIA is capable of yeah. and has and has done, uh, you'd think he would be a little more, I don't know, modest about about some of those things, even in such a casually uh, mundane way. Well, one thing I think is interesting about the CIA and intelligence agencies in general is the fact that it seems like they're something like a primary ponogenic union, you know, like a criminal gang mm -hmm. that's created, but for the human society, you know, with the, you know, kind of a bargain with the devil that, you know, okay, so as long as you're operating overseas or you're spying over there, or you're doing something over, you know, in Brazil or Venezuela or Russia, then, and not here, then everything's fine. But it's, it was from the beginning completely unaccountable, and intelligence was immediately thrown out the window. No, no, no! Intelligence. We don't just need intelligence. We need to. We need covert operations. We mm -hmm. need the dark arts. Is what they were going after, and so then you have this unaccountable bureaucracy that is uh, that operates in the shadows, and that is given free reign and large amounts of money to operate. To do, like you said, Harrison, the dirty things that no one else wants to get done. But at the same time, you've also made sure that they can do whatever dirty things that they want to do. Exactly. So you have enticed a whole substrate of the population, especially in the upper echelons of power that are capable of, you know, move, moving into this, you know, intelligence community and doing whatever they want. You've enticed the the, the darkest of individuals into this operation, so that. You know, in the beginning, sure, maybe you've had uh, th this intelligence community that's, um, you know, what toppling communist regimes because you think that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but now you have them trying to topple an elected president. You know, you've had them assassinate, <laughs> arguably, assassinate uh, uh, U.S. presidents. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest problems, I think, in terms of, you know, just the intelligence industry in general is the fact that you know we all we we look up to our you know our our men and women in uniform you know we're just we're raised to be like that and so when you give them daggers and you you send them in the cloak and dagger operations and then you end up enticing all sorts of psychopaths and other pathological type individuals and it turns into a mafia now you have people looking up to the mafia you know now you have the mafia moving in and spreading its tendrils across your government and so now pretty soon you have kind of something like a pathocracy in the shadows except it's not it's there's it's nothing like the you know the earlier pathocratic regimes but they are they have many of apparently many of the same types of mentalities that you know of a stalin or you know just reading about a you know richard wagner or any of the the dulles brothers or any of the way the way that they thought or carried out operations and very very competent very mm -hmm. intelligent they're you know they're able to topple governments you know they're highly skilled in the ways of the sith but <laughs> you've now you've uh, now you have the sith running your government mm -hmm. essentially unelected unaccountable people who think they have the final say in everything that you do and yet you can't talk about it because you've censored yourself just by part of being an american or being a russian or whatever you know intelligence agency your country uh, you, that, uh, the, the, that you live in you you've censored yourself from talking about it because it's taboo it's you know conspiracy or it's this or that and that's one of the problems that leads up to the the hystericization of society is that you know no you can't talk about the elephant in the room mm -hmm. you know and there's a huge elephant knocking everything over just just yes. knocking <clears throat> everything over mm -hmm. and you're just sitting there like well must be the the leftists or oh dang it those dang republicans the capitalists did it again you know, and it, it's it's not just the CIA, but obviously it's you know the NSA and and uh, and not everyone in their entirety either. Not to right. to say that it's everyone who signs up for the CIA is mm -hmm. like this, but it's individuals who have access to their technologies, to their training, who have who are high up in the in the echelons of power in that upper crust of the elite, who can use those organizations to do whatever they they want around the world you know and and that's one of the big critiques i think people have with with western style american style capitalism is the fact that the cia can go in and topple a government mm -hmm. that corporation come in and and take over that you do have this wicked marriage of capitalist elite and 
the military industrial you know intelligence complex mm -hmm. and you know that i in this day and age that does seem to be one way that maybe a pathocracy could you know come into into being but um yeah it's uh it's definitely you know it's just it's this mafia that we've, you know, unelected mafia that we allow to run around, do whatever they want. And then we blame each other when, you know, they, when they erupt into the, the public domain, because that's what they're good at. Mm -hmm. That's their entire job is to lie, cheat and steal, mm -hmm. whether it's lying about your politics, stealing your elections or you know, <laughs> cheating in, in your elections. That's what they do. And without a leash on them, which something that no president has been strong enough to do. I mean, you'd probably have to have like a Putin, somebody who was in the intelligence community, who has the dirt on all these people who can, you know, come up with the dossier. You know, he's like, you thought the Trump dossier was bad. I got this dossier on you, man. Yeah. You know, I've got the real deal because we've been, you know, spying on you. You thought you were spying on everybody else. But yeah, it's just um, it's just such a huge, complex thing that it's uh that i think viewing it from the lens of of ponerology is really actually pretty helpful to mm -hmm. see it as kind of a, a primary ponergenic union but mm -hmm. that they thought they could control just like you know we thought or they thought they could probably control isis and who knows what isis would have turned into you know if if russia hadn't come in mm -hmm. and, and you know knocked him down mm -hmm. and if uh you know if uh, john brennan who we're, we're just learning was the kind of initiator of, of putting the steel dossier in the hands of the media and, uh, and introducing it to Harry Reid and in the Senate and, and Congress and kind of being the bug and whispering in, into everyone's ear how, how Trump collusion, Trump collusion over two years ago, had former head of CIA known to have lied to Congress, known to have implemented spying on Congress, spying on the American people, Again, former head of CIA, this guy, this mm -hmm. ape, uh, he uh, he is utterly representative of the swamp, of the deep state. He's no longer in power, but for for every John Brennan that we have a name for, you have a dozen other guys who are part of this this kind of latent uh, pathocracy. Who and, and even if they're not part of the CIA, and I like what you said before, Corey, there are a number of respectable. Uh, people with good intentions who are working for intelligence agencies who would rather not see the levels of of wholesale corruption and and carnage and destabilization that they're responsible for globally. Um, but again, uh, you have people who are on the payroll of the CIA uh, who stand to make a lot of money implementing their their policies. Uh, because this is a this is a kind of a a network that Wall Street is involved in, uh, big time. They benefit from the destabilization and and economic hits that uh, that you know our military and intelligence agencies are responsible for implementing in South and Central America. Right now, and they're attempting to do it in Venezuela. You know, who do you think is responsible in large part? The CIA. Um, so, yeah, you know, we, we can, uh, certainly I might have been reading a little too much into it, uh, but at the same time, uh, given what we know, um, we had a wonderful interview with, on The Truth Perspective some years ago with Douglas Valentine, who wrote, uh, The CIA is Organized Crime. And uh, it was everything that you, you just described pretty much, Corey. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is, you know, if, if, if we're going to see some kind of uh, coup in the next couple of years, if, if Trump doesn't toe the line by acting like a neocon, a crazed nut job warmonger, uh, more than he already has, then we might see something. And guess who's going to implement it? The pathocracy. <laughs> that is fueled by organizations like the CIA. Well, I, I imagine that a lot of those types of people who, you know, would, would want a pathocracy, um, you know, they, I, it'd be hard to imagine how they could act, you know, it, maybe they could, maybe they would actually create the situation for a pathocracy, but um, 
you know, it, it seems to me like it would be a very, uh, a very organic thing that that maybe if they did say, but they would want it, they would really, really like to have a, path, a pathocracy because mm -hmm. I mean, all of that, you know, glory and, and blood and guts and the shadows, you know, no, they, they want to come step out into the open. <laughs> I'm sure plenty of them would, would like to, to be treated as, you know, the gods that they think they are, the masters of the universe that they think they are. But I mean, a lot of them, I imagine they're, they're a different breed of, of evil. Uh, you know, just, they just can't even imagine what they they get up to, but they maybe they prefer to keep it in the shadows, the vampires that they are. Well, maybe a, a few thoughts on what you guys have been discussing for the last few minutes. One, like, uh, so the way I see it is, I, I like what you said about uh, the CIA as being like a, um, like a mafia, like a primary ponderogenic union, and because like that's what Douglas Valentine would argue. I was going to bring that up that too. Um, the title of his book, CIA is Organized Crime. He's basically saying that CIA is like a mafia, um, but I also like how both of you made the like the distinction. I would even argue that the majority of the people, probably, that work for the NSA, the CIA, are relatively normal, decent people. And uh, like whenever I read a book, for instance, about you know goings on in the CIA and even the scandals, it's usually there's a lot of like analysts and you know the people reading reading intelligence reports and writing them, who are just like they they're doing what they're doing for genuinely good reasons. And they've got good motivations. And then there's like a boss or, or someone else or someone running covert operations that like they run up against those people. Like the, the, the good hearted people run up against those people. Like so there's the whole thing about Alex Station, like the, um, the, the people in the, like the bin Laden unit of the CIA. And like some like and specifically the FBI agents that were um, that were involved like in that team because they have like they, they share personnel to kind of like overlap so they're they have some you know sharing going on and the like they were just trying to do their jobs and they were doing good jobs but it was like a few people in the chain of command above them who wrecked everything and like so it wasn't any of the analysts fault any of the the people just doing the grunt work it's like those were all just genuinely decent people with good motivations trying to do their jobs and even their jobs were arguably like uh good jobs they were doing what they were doing for good reasons but they ran up against this kind of brick wall within the organization and the, so the way the CIA is structured it's almost like a secret society where you have like a, a whole group of people who are um, you know the workers and and then you've got little kind of like um, cliques and factions um, and it's easy for that to happen with just the nature of, of like compartmentalization and 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 secrecy to the point where um, these processes, like these ponderogenic processes, can can go on without anyone even knowing about it, because they're not allowed to know about it and they're not allowed to talk about it, like you said, Corey. So, what you get is essentially what 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 we've gotten is the um, like over the decades, like since the '60s and arguably like maybe even before that, it's like you've had um, this process going on within the intelligence community, which has which the vast majority of people haven't realized has been going on they haven't seen it going on and that like so there have been individuals and, and small groups of individ individuals within those organizations who have gained a lot of influence and power to the point where even like elected rep representatives don't even know about it and so it, it is like there is a like a secret government and even who was it like a you know, back in the 80s i think that bill moyers or someone like the did a really good report on uh, on TV about this, like, is there a secret government? Because it appears that there, it appears that there is, and um, so what you have is essentially like I'd, I'd ca even call it like a, um, it's this little like mini baby pathocracy, like running the show. It's or pathocrats, I'd say. It's not really a, a pathocracy because it's not a, like the entire social system, but the government is essentially run by pathocrats in secret, and it's 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 no different than when you like look back at. Um, like uh, the history of organized crime and the, like the influence of the mob. Like the mob officially is at odds with the FBI and with the official culture of whatever country they're in, like in the US for, for in this case. But they have their tendrils, they have their bot politicians, their bot police officers, their bot, you know, whatever. They've got influence over certain people so they can, they can get certain things done, they can be protected to a certain degree. 
but their influence is still limited. It's like uh, at no point would we have said that like we're living in a mafia country because the mafia controls everything. They may control a lot, and they may, may control a lot in certain areas, but it's like their, their influence is still re relatively limited. And I'd say that's the normal state of affairs in any country where you have a a, a group, a, a criminal like conspiracy or group that is you know seeking out its own power and influence, and the they'll always get it because there are, there will always be people searching that out especially and and getting it as uh, especially if people are unaware unaware of how that actually works but even if they're aware of how it works um you know influence and money go a long way and you're you're always going to be able to find people who are corruptible so th it's essentially like if you look at aspects of the CIA and the intelligence community as an organized crime like um you know organization then just look at it the way it's the same with the mafia but even worse because they've got you know they're right in the middle of things um but at the same time the, their influence is limited in in the sense that they don't have the ability to totally restructure society they can influence society in all kinds of ways mm -hmm. they can uh, they can influence um you know media representations and and like uh like movies and and put ideas into the in the public mind but they they can never achieve like uh, total domination in the sense that the like a path a pathocracy like, demonstrates um what we what would need for that to happen like you said Corey, is an organic process like the the system would would literally have to be broken down and recreated in order for that to happen because there's too much there's too many normal people even in even in the the CIA even in the US government there there are too many normal people in US society what needs to be happened what needs to what needs to happen is for the entire social social structure to break down and and then to be reintegrated reput together where there are like we said last week there are people at every node of every at the top of every hierarchy to create this this like crystal structure like this rock hard structure of um like inescapable like um and uh, un unbeatable like mm -hmm. pathocracy where it's just like you, there's nowhere to go mm -hmm. at you know so um so yeah just a just a couple points there just that the um, you know, as as bad as things are, things can be worse. But things are really bad, yes. and the CIA is <laughs> like like there is so much bad stuff that goes on in the CIA that people aren't even aware of, and that even people like even people like Pompeo might even not be aware of, even though he right. was the you know the head of the CIA. Like the the head of the CIA doesn't necessarily know what's going on all the time, and because he's a, a temporary like figurehead. Like uh, if you really want to know what goes on in the CIA, you look at the the people who are like career intelligence people who have been there a long time and who 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 are involved in these kind of like more shady activities in the CIA. That's why I think it's like really terrible that like Gina Haspel is the head of the CIA now because she has been like in there for a long time and she's been at like the forefront of every bad decision the CIA has made over the last 18 years. She's been right in the middle of it, but uh, personal opinion on her. Well, so uh, it's come out that the that the CIA was responsible for the kind of countercultural uh, music movement in the 60s and 70s at Laurel Canyon, uh, and to, to some degree. Uh, they have been part of COINTELPRO. They have influenced social movements. Uh, you mentioned um, you know, the, their effect in the media <clears throat> with Operation Mockingbird. Um, so it, it's just, it's incredible to think uh, decades on what we've learned about how pervasive and deep their influence has been in American culture, even if it isn't uh, comprehensive, it, it is pretty far reaching. And uh, just something to consider, because uh, I think it really begs the question, if, if it took decades of time for us to uh, come to understand um, what happened decades ago, in terms of implement, implementing their influence uh, over U.S. society, culture, not to mention um, more kind of geopolitical objectives, what are they up to right now that we that we're ignorant of? Well, I th I think that's a that's a really good point, and I, th I think it's also brings up why you know, uh, a message of clean your own room or keep your room clean or whatever Jordan Peterson says is so important because as we've been discussing, 
uh, these processes are they're ongoing. They're always going on. There's always some someone in the shadows, you know, figuratively speaking, that's that's acting and striving. You know, they have this like magnetic center that just draws them towards evil, and they'll constantly they're constantly striving to to a, achieve an, a position where they can practice that evil. And there's no shortage of, of people out there that do that, but they are a minority of the population. And in most societies, they're a minority of the population. And the only thing it seems that uh, the biggest problem really is that the other, the majority of the population isn't, hasn't, doesn't have the opposite tack. We don't, we don't have the opposite orientation. Um, you know, we're, it's, it's, we're just kind of lukewarm. Well, we'll just live, live, let live. And the problem is, is that as these evil people are constantly, you know, lying, causing trouble, causing mischief, antagonizing people, it whips society up into a, into an hysteria until to the point where, you know, we're so lax and we're so lazy. We've lost so much character, you know, thanks to our own moral failings and the activities of all these spellbinders and and pathological individuals that we just melt down society melts down we go we we start a revolution we go to we we think that the only way to solve our problems is to go to war with an with one another uh, you know civil war brother against brother our social ties collapse our moral system collapses and that's when the pathocracy starts to take shape that's when the evil it becomes triumphant but, you know, as long as, I mean, if, if society, if we have the opposite belief system, if we've, we can attain the opposite magnetic center so that we're striving constantly to be better, to be more competent, to develop more and more, you know, sophisticated systems of culture, we protect ourselves from that. That's, that's how we protect ourselves from that ultimate form of evil, is by creating strong social ties, de you know, developing ourselves to the point that we can sustain you know these these systems, and then develop even more. Uh, you know, competent and intelligent, sophisticated systems of of governance, technology, economy, and of reasoning, of you know, of religion. And you know, if we don't, obviously, when you look back at the you know the collapse of the Christian belief system in the West, and how everyone you know uh, philosophers were saying it's this this is horrible. It's going to be the the end of of times, and then. Everyone's like, no, it's just fairy tales, just belief in God. But then, what would have we? What have we been talking about? Marxism, you know, Stalinism, Hitler, Nazi Germany, all of these systems of belief that came in and filled the gap, the void that was left the, by this mat a materialistic view of the of the universe. But you know, scientific uh, materialism, Darwinism, all of these views of the universe that that are materialistic and they don't we don't have the the systems really in place anymore to to develop this you know higher belief and higher values um you know just just to just to end it there i mean it's it's just been a collapse really it's been a collapse and and that's and that's why i think that we saw the pathocracies that we did see and in order to avoid the pathocracies of the future we're going to have to build that from within ourselves. We'll have to find those higher values ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good place to stop. So uh, we didn't really get to the rest of the what we we're going to talk about this chapter, but we'll get to it in the future, of course. So uh, maybe in a few weeks. So uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. And we'll be back again next week. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Thank you, everybody.